when I was asked to give this lecture, I knew I could not say no, because if I had said no, my access to bone scan for the next perhaps weeks, months, or perhaps even years would have been absolutely minimal. But moving on, so um, we, we obviously had a great lecture just now, and uh, from somebody who's been involved in uh, doing quite a lot of these studies with these new drugs. Uh, so there is quite a lot of repetition that would give us the opportunity just to, by, by repeating things, just to try to understand things a little bit better and just um, emphasize the key points. Um, am I right to assume that most of you are nuclear medicine physicians and therefore you're not really using these drugs? Is that, is that, is that right? Is that correct? Yeah? Okay, so, um, so you haven't, he well, you've probably heard of them, you know about, uh, a bit about them, but um, perhaps not so much detail, and we can just go a little bit into that. So, and, and one of the things we just need to bear in mind is the proportion of the problem. Obviously, iodine, um, the, the, the no longer iodine avid uh, disease is quite nasty, but uh, the timing of use of these agents and the toxicity of those agents, I think, still needs to be taken into consideration. And uh, they do have side effects, this drug, and it's important just to bear that in mind. So um, the overview uh, of the lecture is just briefly mentioned one or two slides about epidemiology. It's all already been captured. Um, then talk very briefly about um, non-iodinavid disease. I have three or four slides about chemotherapy because we, we did used to use chemotherapy up to a few years ago. And then uh, the molecular biology is the most important issue here, really. And uh, obviously, we just had quite a lot on it, but I'll just go briefly over it again. The phase two studies, and we've got two randomized trials that have been mentioned. We'll just, uh, just discuss them very quickly. Um, so we know it's increasing, and we've got the SEER data. We've just seen them. It's, it's, it's a cancer which is increasing in incidence. And uh, as we've seen, uh, contrary to what is happening with other cancers in the U.S., for instance, colon cancer, lung cancer, etc., the mortality is at least stable or increasing. And, and therefore, I think there is a consensus now that um, um, this is not just because we're picking indolent disease, uh, very sort of because we're doing ultrasounds to every woman that drives through the surgery, but we are actually picking patients uh, who, ha who are destined to have uh, clinical disease. These are the data from Cyprus. This, this has more tumors localized disease, and uh, you can see that there is um, uh, quite a marked increase, two to three folds over the last few years. And, um, but when you also see the patients with regional disease or the lymph node disease, again, we've got increased. These, these are significant cancers. These are not the microcarcinomas. So I think that's an important um, message. Now, um, we've just discussed um, um, the problem of um, um, recurrent differential thyroid cancer when it's non-iodine uh, avid. So you, we, we, we lose that magic bullet. And those patients then have metastatic disease, and really um, it's difficult to know what to do with them. And um, the, you, you still need to bear in and I just wanted to make um, the point that um, the patients with non iodine avid disease are not all going to behave the same way, and there are going to be some patients who are going to have relatively indolent disease, so slow tempo asymptomatic disease. Uh, I think those patients need to be considered in a different way. This is the protocol that we used to have in Newcastle when I used to work in Newcastle. Newcastle being a center that had been involved with the British Thyroid Association guidelines, still Petros Peros is the first author of those guidelines, and has been involved in various things, like the HALO study. And that was our sort of regimen of looking into things, uh, going with the iodine scan, um, looking then if, um, if the scan is negative, if there is an intention to treat them, we'll uh, do conventional staging of the neck, chest, Etc., and then we'll do for PET scan, we'll review all the imaging, and then the, we consider the various options like surgery or external beam radiotherapy. And at that time, also, we had a chemotherapy trial, etc. Et so, and, and that's the things that we were sort of involved back at that time. Um, so, let, let, let me just go briefly over chemo. Um, 
Now, there are a number of trials. Uh, it's important just to bear in mind that these are really old trials. Um, there is a review of those trials, about 248 patients with single agent doxorubicin, uh, different doses, and what looks like a very promising response rate is quite, quite high at 38%. And um, when you look at the single agent studies with mitosome thrombolyomycin, cisplatin, not really much evidence of benefit there. A combination chemotherapy, especially the dox blood in a combination, more toxicity, not doing them much better. But um, when you look at all those data together, um, doxorubicin is the most active agent, which is fair enough. Uh, combination probably no better than single agent. But um, the key thing is that whatever was produced those days was produced at a time when no standardization of response rates. So it, it was not with resist. And in, in, in real, in more recently, studies that have tried to reproduce those results have failed. And I'm just going to show you an example of the study that we did with liposomal um, um, doxorubicin in Newcastle, uh, where we were thinking that if we have an effective agent, let's assume it's an effective doxorubicin, can we give it in a better formulation with less toxicity? And in fact, um, we, we failed in that. We had a phase two Simon to stage design study and uh, with a, pre, uh, and a specification in the protocol that we're looking for two responses in the first 14 patients. And unfortunately, we did not see a single response by the first 13 patients. And, uh, and as a result, the study was closed. We also looked at redifferentiation, whether you could get rid of the dedifferentiated uh, um, tumor cells with, uh, with the chemo and leave the differentiated ones behind, but that was equally negative. And similar data have been produced, at least by two other groups from, uh, this is a South African study. Again, they only had a 5% response rate. And this is from, um, um, uh, Athanas Argiris uh, from the US, combination with interferon here and a slightly lower dose of dogs, et cetera. But again, we're talking about very small response rate. So I think essentially uh, there of chemotherapy is gone. And uh, there of, um, of the targeted therapy and uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors is that what we're doing now. So the molecular biology, I'll just go briefly over what was, has just been said. Essentially, we've got two specific pathways, and we've got three specific uh, mutations. So we've discussed about uh, the ras rafmap kinase pathway and the pi 3 k aktm to pathways, and we're going to see them again in a, in a, in a drawing in a minute. And the, and the mutations, we've got the b -RAF uh, V600E mutation, about 40 to 45% of papillary or PTC, and the RAS is about 20 40% in follicular and about 10% in papillary, and then rearrangement of red protein oncogene uh, varies between 18 to 25 of PTC. So it's important just to bear in mind we've got three main mutations here, we've got two pathways. Um, got also PI3K mutations in minority of patients and more amplifications in others. Leaving aside the PI3K amplification, as was said before, these appear to be mutually exclusive and that, that makes, um, makes it more likely that these are tumors that uh, derive the stimulation and they've got oncogene addiction to those specific mutations. So here you could just see um, um, the, the drawing of those, if, um, if I can just um, use the pointer. So, is the pointer here? So, yes, so essentially, we've got one pathway here, which is very important that those uh, cells are receptors for light that can stimulate the pathology of the past, seeing that it's with that. Um, and then we've got the red, uh, rather proud, make a uh, pathway here. To also um, and angiogenesis uh, is an important, um, I'm just going to skip that, um, uh, pathway in the sense that there is crosstalk and autocrine 
uh, sorry, paracrine stimulation between uh, tumor cells into tumor endothelial cells, which can see next door, and, um, and, and, and the vascular cells. So those are the main um, pathways, I suppose, that we can hit with the drugs that we've got right now. So let me just go now over the phase two studies of TKIs uh, in the management of non-iodine uh, disease. And uh, I think that's a, useful, um, uh, that's a useful table just to bear in mind. So we've got the drugs. I mean, it's already been discussed, but it's just worth bearing in mind. I'll just show you. So MEG inhibitors, we've just discussed, we just heard about redifferentiation re story. So um, th those are important groups um, of drugs. So the drugs that would do something on BRAF, the drugs that would target here, and the drugs that would target the MEC, perhaps a, a, an easy way of thinking about them. Um, so they, the other thing is that these drugs, probably with the uh, uh, exception of the, uh, some of the BRAF inhibitors, um, they are very promiscuous drugs. They go with various partners. Um, so they inhibit multiple kinases. They've got some differences. Um, so for instance, accipinate is probably the most effective in terms of um, IC50s, the inhibitory concentration, especially for the VGFR targets. Um, there are um, differences in terms of, for instance, sunidinib being able to target 38 different kinases. Um, so it, there's more differences which are important. And I think um, the next five or 10 years, I think the, the last five years, we, we've shown that these agents have got efficacy. The next five or 10 years, we need to sort out uh, the personalization and uh, determining which is going to be the best drug uh, for each patient. And, and as you heard, so far we are not there. So this is some of the phase two studies. I think there are 18 studies, but I'll just go through this just to show that uh, roughly what you see, I mean, there's small numbers of patients. To start with, quite a, um, you would have patients both with the differential thyroid cancer, with medullary, sometimes even anaplastic. And, and roughly what you see is um, um, the third column from the right is about 15 to 30% response rate, stable disease up to 50 or 60%, and a median PFS around 12 months. When you look at the accidentally studies, they're just slightly better, but again, there's quite a lot about patient selection into these studies, but roughly this is what this class of agents can do. So uh, you get responses in about a third of the patients, perhaps a little bit more with some agents, and you get a PFS of, let's say, 12 to 18 months. And uh, I'm not going to discuss them in too much detail, just again to make the point of the waterfall plot. So when you look at response rates, you know there is this, num this uh, the figure of 30% reduction, which is here. So you only capture those that have been responded. But clearly, uh, quite a lot of patients which would be classified stable disease would have reduction in the tumor size. So waterfall plots are probably a way of looking at these agents uh, in, in a bit more detail. And here again, you can see um, different studies for serafinib. Serafinib being the drug that has been used probably. Uh, we've got more data than other drugs. Uh, Pazopanib, uh, again, it, it was mentioned before, also seems very promising. We only have phase two data. Again, um, the response rates appears to be, appear to be quite high, at least in this study. So this is 49% um, uh, PR by resist, so that's important. Still, you've got issues about toxicity, which I'm not going to go to in, in too much details. Accidentib, we just discussed that. The median PFS looks to be a little bit better, but again, we have no phase three data, and therefore FDA or EMEA 
cannot make decisions right now about approving these agents. Um, Sunidnib has got sort of intermediate data. Um, um, again, um, along the lines that we've sort of discussed before, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Lenvadinib, the phase two study has been presented before, and we've seen the phase three data. It is a very interesting drug, Lenvadinib, and I think it's fair to say that as oncologists, we don't really know why it is performing so well. It's performing extremely well also in kidney cancer, and we're, about, we're waiting now for a phase three study uh, in kidney cancer. Um, it seems to be also better tolerated. We, we had trouble combining agents in kidney cancer, uh, especially agents that target the VGF pathway with uh, agents that target the mTOR pathway. We just ha heard at ASCO this year that uh, it can be done, and the PFS was better than anybody could have imagined as second-line therapy from the five months. We've gone now to 17 months. So, uh, this is an exciting agent, not just for thyroid cancer, but elsewhere. elsewhere. The same applies for cabozantinib, and we've got, again, very little data for cabozantinib. But um, again, we've just heard um, in Vienna about two months ago about this agent as used as second-line therapy uh, in kidney cancer, and it's, it's very exciting. It's about to get approval there. And, um, and I think those are agents that we're going to have to wait and hear a little bit more, and, and, and I think they are very promising. Vandedanib, we've seen the data. There is a randomized phase two study um, which has shown uh, benefit, but again, it was a phase two study. We do not have phase three data for that agent. Um, equally, uh, toxicity, just to mention the QTC prolongation. I've had one patient with problems with that, and, and, and just bear, bear in mind that it does need um, careful attention to detail and what drugs the patients are on. Um, now, there are few data for, now we've moved from the VGFR TKIs, the drugs that we've discussed work on angiogenesis, to the drugs that work on, uh, uh, on BRAF, and here, I think the puzzle for me is that when you look at BRAF mutated melanoma, or when you look at oncogenic addiction in non-small cell lung cancer, and you've got one key oncogenic driver and you block it, you get 70% or 60% response rate. This does not really happen in thyroid cancer. But we, we just need to see. I mean, we're looking at small studies. I think the one is from MD Anderson, the first study, um, and the other one is from Marcia Brose. But I think we just need to see more data for these agents. And, and this is the brafenib, which is the, the glaxo, the glaxo BRAF inhibitor. So um, moving on to another class of agents, the mTOR inhibitors, uh, which are further downstream, uh, the PI3K, AKT, uh, and then mTOR pathway. So downstream, you can block it further down. Response rates for the mTOR uh, drugs, whichever kind of cancer you look at, are always low. But the issue is, what do you do in terms of some shrinkage and stable disease? And here you've got, essentially, the waterfall plot shows about 71% tumor shrinkage. And although we do think there may not be the best drugs, still you get this PFS of 10 months. Now, if you put this with lenvatinib in, in, in kidney cancer, it does wonders. So I think we just need to sort of explore these drugs further. And I think combinations are going to come in the years um, uh, to come. So what we've learned from the phase two studies is that there are promising results, partial response to stabilization of disease. There is toxicity, which I've not discussed in great detail, and there's clearly in every patient you'll expect to get resistance in about a year or a year and a half. The, um, so the phase three studies, we've just gone through them, so I'm not going to spend more than a couple of minutes, so we've got two drugs approved, sorafenib, lembatinib, and that was the answer also to the MCQ. So 100% of you can get it right now. So decision, you, uh, we've just been discussing, in fact, the same slide I think we've just used, so I'm just going to skip the slides and you can see the difference in uh, um, PFS in, in just this one. So essentially you've got more than double or, or roughly doubling of um, uh, PFS. Uh, the overall survival, really the data that, well, it hasn't been rich, I would just uh, say this. And there is toxicity with sorafenib. I think, you know, I, I've been using sorafenib since probably 2005, 2006, and, and there is an art to it. And I think, um, you know, 10 years ago, oncologists were not using these drugs correctly, and I think now we are learning 
how to use them and how to prevent and how to stop the toxicity. So, you know, you need to manage pre preactively the, the hand foot syndrome before you get there. And happily here in Cyprus, in fact, we, we've got a nurse sponsored by the company that does go around and help them out. And we do stuff with the hand foot syndrome to help them. Um, so the data from the phase three study from decision give uh, essentially serafinib is the first agent to be approved. And then we've got the select uh, study again. Um, Camilla went through it and uh, it showed an impressive improvement in PFS. And therefore, again, this drug has been approved for use for um, no longer iodinavid disease. Again, with the issue about toxicity, I've just put it in, uh, in yellow, the issues, and quite common a sort of signature of, uh, of um, side effects of uh, predominantly VGFTKIs in terms of hypertension, proteinuria, et cetera. Um, now, I just want to move on to the sort of personalized medicine, and we've heard it before. We are not there. I mean, you would have thought that if you had a tumor that was BRAF mutant and you gave a, a, a BRAF uh, a mutant blocking drug, you have better results as doing anything else. So we should have seen different differences. Um, this, this, and, and we've seen the slides again, it doesn't appear right now that mutational status uh, is a predictive factor, and we're not very happy, obviously, about this. Uh, but then again, there is quite a lot of things going on. I mean, we're not just talking about one pathway. Perhaps the paracrine loop with the VGFR and, and other things that are happening are, are, are essentially confusing the scenario. And um, so this is, uh, so essentially from both decision and other studies, uh, we have not had clear predictive factors uh, for this. Um, there is a smaller retrospective analysis of uh, uh, with lenvatinib where there seems some kind of combination of cytokine, androgenic factors may give some uh, external validation as a predictive factor, but I think we're at early days and we don't really know which one to use. Um, so redifferentiation therapy has just been uh, covered, so the selumetinib data we've just seen, and there are similarly with a very small f uh, number of patient, seven patient study with daprofenib. So um, this is a promise that uh, somehow we're going to get the sodium uh, important gene to work or we're going to get rid of the dedifferentiated uh, pool, the clone, and all of a sudden we're going to have our magic bullet working again. And I think that's a great uh, promise for the future. But again, we're not there. Uh, just one or two slides. I've got one slide for sequencing. Um, again, a study from MD Anderson that um, uh, looked at first and second line drugs. S first line predominantly was sorafenib, and then second line was various other agents like sunidinib, pazopenib, capozandinib, levantinib, etc. And in fact, y you get at least as good responses as second time round. And, and it's something that we knew that VGFR to KIs, there's no true overlapping toxicity, so you could get a response. A response. Here the data clearly are better than kidney cancer. We would never imagine to get so much, uh, uh, so good results at second line. And I think a, a little bit has to do with the extra kinases that these agents inhibit. Um, now, important issues is toxicity. So, uh, you know, there is GI toxicity, they've got some mouth, they've got anorexia, nausea, sometimes vomiting not too bad. Diarrhea with some agents can be extremely troublesome. Um, and then fatigue, hypertension uh, is important to, to manage. Uh, I, I ask my patients to do their blood pressure almost every day. Uh, they, they come back with a sort of piece of paper and I can see what their blood pressure is and all the rest of it. Hand foot syndrome we've discussed. So, and then there are the more rare but more serious toxicity. We know that there are two or three percent incidence of cardiac events with sunidinib and sorafenib in other set, uh, um, settings, for instance, kidney cancer or HCC. Um, the hemorrhage uh, risk, hepatotoxicity, QTC prolongation. So, just bear that in mind that is, um, is, is handing a tablet is, is not just like handing candy. So, okay. Who needs treatment and when? Um, so I, I think the rules are make sure that the disease is actually progressing. 
and the patient is symptomatic. And if it's not symptomatic, it's somebody that you are worried by the next time you see them, they're going to be uh, symptomatic or in trouble uh, with imminent uh, organ impairment, etc. Um, let me just uh, show you one of the patients Dr. Franco said to me. I think it's a nice way of coming to the close. So he said to me, please go and see this patient on the ward. So this is a, a, a chap that was managed elsewhere, to be honest. Uh, but essentially, um, he had advanced disease from, from the outlet uh, from the beginning. He did have surgery. So this is October 2011. Then November, he had surgery. Um, he did have ra radioactive iodine, uh, I think, in Nicosia General Hospital. Uh, I think at that time, he was probably already iodine uh, negative. Uh, anyway, um, from December to June 2012, then um, nothing major happened, but then he had lymphadenectomy. And then in August, uh, he kind of came over to us, and the, the, the scan that uh, Savas did for him showed no uptake, uh, 152,000 thyroglobulin um, and with TSA stimulation, okay? So I was asked to see him, I think, on the 17th of October when the patient had 76% oxygen saturation and a scan which shows a little bit of disease in his lungs. So, um, and um, I mean, we didn't have uh, serafinib approved at that time. We had to have various deliberations with, uh, with various people. But anyway, he, in the end, the patient had to pay for it and he did respond very quickly to it. So oxygen saturation went up to 93%, able to walk, and you can see the thyroglobulin response, et cetera. He was able to go home, and this is a scan just about two, three months later, showing better. He, this was a, a, a fairly short-lived response, to be honest, but I mean, again, uh, so the timing, don't start too early, but don't leave it too late. I think that's the sort of message from this uh, story. And um, just, just remember, there are patients who with slowly progressive asymptomatic disease do not do, not do anything to these patients. Um, you know, we don't want them to have this treatment unless it's absolutely necessary. Okay, conclusions. I, I think these agents are now first-line therapies and sorafenib and lenvatinib. Um, you need to be careful about documenting disease progression before you start them and whether they're symptomatic. There is toxicity to this treatment. Um, we need to do more work on predictive biomarkers. We are just not there. It looked to be very easy, but it is not so far. And uh, we don't have clear selection criteria really for TKIs, but people could think that if there is a contraindication for using, uh, for instance, uh, one agent, you use the other etc. Um, second line TKIs appear to be very good, at least as good as first line TKIs and ongoing studies are uh, going to shed some more light from combination treatment. And uh, just to finish by sort of making the point that A, in Cyprus right now we've got no approval for these drugs. The cost of these drugs is, is quite high. It's in the region of between three plus thousand euros per month. Um, I mean, our trip patients, sometimes they pay, and uh, now we've got patients who've got private insurance, all good, but um, uh, it's tricky for the healthcare systems to cope with it. Thank you.